Hi everyone and welcome to this week's crime and punishment story. This week I am covering the story of John Miller, John Robert Miller and the murder of Joseph Ferguson in Colour Courts in 1901. But before we begin, can I just say if you do enjoy this video then please give it a thumbs up and if you are new here or haven't already done so then do please consider subscribing to the channel to help support the content we create. Thank you. John Robert Miller was born in Newcastle upon Tyne in around 1870 to parents James and Mary and was one of at least seven children. At the time of the murder he was said to be 31 years old. John Robert was described as being a travelling musician and it was said that he played the harp. He was also described as a very heavy drinker and had previously spent time in an asylum in Yorkshire. He had been injured when he was younger and it was said this had changed his personality and drinking seemed to be something he had little control over. John Miller was born in around 1834 and at the time of the murder he was said to be around 67 years old. He was also the uncle of John Robert Miller and was described in some articles as being the son of Mary Ferguson wife of the victim Joseph. However, it seems she was actually his stepmother. John was described as being a hawker, but it is not stated what kind of things he sold. In one news article, it was also said that he played the violin and was either blind in one eye or had little vision in one eye. Joseph Ferguson was born in around 1848 in Yorkshire. At the time of his death, he was said to be around 53 years old and worked as a joiner. He had married Mary Miller after her husband had died and the couple lived together in colour coats. Joseph's age is a little confusing. In some reports, he's said to be 53, in others 60, and in others he's said to be 65. However, the 1901 census when the couple lived in Dub Street in Colour Courts, he is listed as being 53 and Mary is 63. Due to both men being called John Miller, I will refer to the younger by including his middle name of Robert to hopefully avoid any confusion. On the day of September the 20th, 1901, Mr and Mrs Ferguson were in their upstairs flat in Huddleston Street in Colour Courts when someone knocked at the door. Mary Ferguson tried to stop Joseph from going to the door, but Joseph still went downstairs to answer it. He opened the door to John and John Robert Miller and both men stepped inside with John closing the door behind them. Immediately and without warning, Joseph was attacked with a knife and left for dead at the bottom of the stairs. His head was pressed against the front door, stopping it from opening. Mary Ferguson had seen some of the attack, but the light was not good and she could not be sure what had happened. John and John Robert went up the stairs and on passing the room where Mary Ferguson was standing, one of the men said, There now, we have stabbed him to death. Throwing a knife onto the floor, they then went down the back stairs and into the yard and into the back lane. It was said that John washed his hands in a tub in the yard, but John Robert did not and his hands were covered with blood. Mary Ferguson opened a bedroom window and shouted into the street for a neighbour and a child was sent to fetch the police. The two men were kept in the lane until the police arrived by the crowd that had gathered outside. PC Whitehead arrested both men and took them to North Shields Police Station where they were both later charged with the willful murder of Joseph Ferguson. Dr Brumwell and Dr Phillips were sent for and on their arrival they examined Joseph and found he was already dead. He had many wounds to his body and neck including defensive wounds to both of his hands. They believed he had died almost instantly from massive blood loss caused by one of the wounds in his neck. Before the inquest both men were transferred to Newcastle prison. It was said that quite a crowd had gathered outside North Shields police station in the hope of seeing them but they were quickly pushed into a cab and hurriedly driven away. The inquest was opened on September the 23rd at the Bay Hotel in Colour Courts. Neither John or John Robert were present, and the coroner stated that further investigation was needed before witnesses could be called, 
and only Mary Ferguson was called to identify the body and she stated it was that of her husband Joseph who worked as a carpenter. The inquest was then adjourned until the beginning of October. When it was resumed, it was again held at the Bay Hotel in Colour Courts, and this time both John and John Robert were present. Mary Ferguson stated that she had been married to Joseph for around four years. Previously, she had been married to John Miller Sr., who had died. He had been related to both of the men charged with the death of Joseph. She said she had been in the home together with Joseph on September the 20th, when she heard someone knocking. She tried to stop Joseph going to answer it as she thought it might have been John and John Robert. When the door was opened, she did not hear any words pass between the three men, nor did she hear the door being closed, but she did hear some scuffling at the foot of the stairs. She said she shouted down to Joseph saying, Come up, you have been a long time down there, but she got no answer, so she went to the top of the stairs and looked down. This was the point when she saw John Robert coming up the stairs carrying the knife. She said to him, You villain, you have killed Joseph. And he replied, Yes. She stated that after they had ran down the back stairs, she went halfway down the front stairs and there she saw Joseph. She knew at once that he was dead. She saw the blood on the stairs and on his body. She then asked a neighbour to fetch a policeman. When asked, she stated that John was the son of her first husband and that John Robert was his grandson. I must add here that in another news report it was stated that she had had trouble identifying who had been carrying the knife and it is often difficult to get the true details as even when reporters were all in the same courtroom the news articles could often differ quite wildly. Robert Oliver, who was 13 years old, said he had seen the two men in Huddleston Street on September the 20th. He said the younger man knocked on the door and the older man appeared to try and hide himself from view by stepping into the adjoining doorway. When the door was opened, the younger man, John Robert, rushed inside and the older man, John, followed quite quickly, closing the door behind him. Isabella Mason of Simpson Street said her back door faced the back door of the home of the Fergusons. She, heard, she said she heard some noises and on going out to look she saw John and John Robert in the lane. Mrs Ferguson was also there and she told her what had happened. She went into the house and looked down the staircase. She saw Joseph lying at the bottom. When she came back out she heard John say that Joseph had been stabbed three or four times. She said John Roberts spoke to him saying, You made me do it, you irritated me, you gave me drink and you gave me the knife. She said John Robert was also complaining that his head felt hot and he dipped it into the same tub of water that John had washed his hands in. Margaret Brown said she had also seen the two men standing in the lane and she said John Robert had told John, You have worked me up to this pitch. Mr Purvis, who had a shop in Savile Street in North Shields, said that John and John Robert came into his shop on September the 20th at around 2.30pm. John had asked to see some knives. Mr Purvis said he showed them some, but John said they were not the kind they wanted. He said John Robert was going to see to be a cook and needed something bigger, so he showed them some sheath knives. John chose one and John Robert paid for it and then handed the change to John. Mr Purvis said the knife shown at the inquest was the one he had sold to the prisoners. PC Whitehead said he had been called to the house on September the 20th. He had gone inside and seen the body of Joseph in a pool of blood at the bottom of the stairs. He then went into the backyard and handcuffed the two men and he took them to North Shields Police Station. He had searched them at Colourcoats Railway Station and it was then that he found the sheath for the knife in the possession of John Robert. He later found the knife itself. When he went inside, it was on the stairs at the home of Mr and Mrs Ferguson. Inspector McQueen said he was on duty when John and John Robert were brought into custody. He said John Robert said, It was I that murdered the man. It was I that committed the crime. He stopped him speaking, saying he would have a chance to make any statements later. There was, he said, a wound on John Robert's hand. 
When they were later charged with the willful murder of Joseph Ferguson, he said, John said, I know nothing about it at all. I am as innocent as a babe unborn. I believe if I had my eyesight, I could have stopped it. John Roberts said, I simply say I deserve all I get for being such a fool. I was mad with the drink or I would never have done such a thing. That is all I have to say. I am very sorry. God bless everyone. Dr Phillips said he had examined the body of Joseph Ferguson at his home in Huddleston Street. He said he was lying at the foot of the stairs with his arms by his side. His head was touching the front door and his feet were at the bottom of the stairs. There was a lot of blood on the walls and floor. He later performed the post-mortem and found Joseph had many stab wounds to his neck and chest and he believed that death had been due to blood loss from the stab wounds in his neck. The coroner stated it was for the jury to decide if both men were guilty of the crime. Whether it had been John or John Robert who had inflicted the wounds, the other had been Aidan and Abetton and was therefore equally liable for what had happened. The jury at the inquest retired for only a few minutes before returning a verdict of guilty of willful murder against both John Miller and John Robert Miller and they were both committed for trial. The funeral of Joseph Ferguson took place on September the 24th, 1901. It was a very small funeral. Mary Ferguson did not attend and there were only five of Joseph's relatives who followed the hearse on foot from Colour Courts to Preston Cemetery. These included his brother Ralph, who had already walked from Newcastle, and his son George. It is not said why Mary did not attend, but perhaps she did not feel able to do so, especially if she was going to have to walk there and walk back. Crowds of people had gathered near to Huddleston Street to watch the hearse pass by, and the paper said that while many were there to pay their respects to the man who was described as being quiet and good-natured, they also felt many were there purely because he had been murdered. I did not find any details of a headstone in Preston Cemetery. The trial took place at the Moot Hall in Newcastle in early November of 1901 in front of Justice Grantham. Both men pleaded not guilty, with John Robert adding, I can't say I am guilty. Zephaniah Miller, who was not related to the prisoners, said he lived in Simpson Street. He saw the two men on September the 20th leaning over the railings at Colour Courts, talking and looking out towards the sea. He said they then headed in the direction of the Bay Hotel. They did not stop there for longer than a minute before heading off in the direction of Dub Street, where the Fergusons had lived until recently. It was as if they did not know they no longer lived there. But a very short time later, he saw them head towards Huddleston Street. He believed they were both drunk. He said John Robert seemed to be staggering about, but he could not say if they knew what they were doing. A short time later, around 10 or 15 minutes, he heard from other neighbours that something had happened and he went into the back lane and saw a crowd of people and John and John Robert. He believed that John had blood on his face. He went into the flat by the back stairs and the couple's dog was barking at the top, so he called out to Mrs Ferguson and she told him to come up. He saw the body of Joseph, he went down to look to see if he was still alive but he believed he was already dead. He could not hear him breathing and he could not feel any pulse. He went back outside and asked if any of the women would go upstairs and keep Mrs Ferguson company, but he did not state if anyone did this. He said John Robert seemed to be pacing back and forward and seemed to him to be in a very agitated state. He ended by saying that he had been one of the men who had told the crowd to keep John and John Robert in the lane until the police arrived. Mr Purvis of Savile Street, North Shields, gave the same evidence as he had done at the inquest, only adding that he had known the elder man, John Miller, for around 20 years. He often bought knives from him and sold them on at a profit. He also added that he believed both men had been drunk when they had been in his shop, with John Robert appearing to be stupid with the drink in his opinion. Robert Oliver gave the same evidence as he had done at the inquest, only adding that John Robert had not used the door knocker but had banged on the door with his fist. 
Mary Ferguson gave similar evidence to that at the inquest regarding the men's arrival at her home and the subsequent attack of Joseph. She added that her memory was not what it used to be. The prisoners may have stopped at her home for a few for a week a few years ago, but since then she had not seen them very often. When asked, she stated there had been no arguments unless John and John Robert were worried about money, which she had planned to leave to Joseph. She stated they would have been fine if they had kept to themselves. She had always made sure they were okay, giving them money whenever they had asked for it. They had no need to be jealous of Joseph getting money and them not getting any. Isabella Mason and Margaret Brown gave the same evidence as they had done at the inquest. James Melvin said he was a grocer of Huddleston Street. His shop was directly opposite the Ferguson's home. He said on September the 20th he heard a loud knocking and on looking outside he saw John and John Robert on the doorstep. He saw Joseph open the door and the two men went inside. After this he said he heard their dog bark then he heard no more until Mary Ferguson shouted out of the window for someone to go for the police. Later he said he had gone into the back lane and saw John leaning against the wall trying to light his pipe. He said John Robert was pacing about, sometimes talking to the people who had gathered in the lane. And he said he had also told the people not to let the men go until the police arrived. PC Whitehead and Inspector McQueen gave the same evidence as they had done at the trial, with only Inspector McQueen adding, when asked his opinion, that he believed the younger of the two men, John Robert, had understood the crime that he was being charged with. He did not seem to him to be a fool. A doctor by the name of Mr. Hingston was called. He was the medical superintendent at the North Riding Asylum in Yorkshire. He stated that John Robert had been in the asylum from 1898 until 1899, when he had been released as cured. He had been in the asylum suffering from mania as a result of drink. Prior to this, he had been in the workhouse at Thirsk, where he had suffered from delusions, also as a result of his heavy drinking. He was stated that many years before, when John Robert was a child, he had been kicked in the head by a horse. After this, it was said his personality changed completely, and Dr. Hingston said it would be more he would be more liable of attacks of insanity than anyone else. He also stated that as a heavy drinker, he would also suffer more from delusions, and that even small amounts of drink would make him insensible. He went on to say that John Robert had told him that he often drank between one and two bottles of whiskey per day. Dr. Hingston stated that once in custody and no longer drinking, John Robert had become almost insane. This was in direct result of him stopping the drink suddenly. When asked if he thought he would have known what he was doing on September the 20th, the doctor said that even a small amount of drink would make him irresponsible and he was very easily led, so he would do anything that was asked of him. The judge then asked if he would know the difference between right and wrong. However, the doctor stated he could not say for sure. Dr. Calcott of the Cox Lodge Asylum said he had examined John Robert on a few occasions since his arrest. John Robert had told him he had no memory of the events at the home of the Fergusons on September the 20th. However, he did remember missing his train earlier in the day and deciding to go and visit his uncle in No Shields. He did not remember going to buy a knife and he had no need to buy one. He claimed to have been on good terms with Mrs. Ferguson but did not mention Joseph. Dr. Calcott said on some of these visits he had found John Roberts to be confused and forgetful. He did not feel that he was insane. He stated that he had the ability to play the harp and he did not think a man suffering insanity would be able to do this. But he was not sure how responsible he would have been on the day of the crime as he was very drunk that day, which would have affected his judgment enormously. James Miller said he was a heart maker and he was the brother of John Robert. He recalled living with a grandmother in Clayton Street in Newcastle when they were younger and it was then that 
His brother was kicked in the head by a horse. He remembered him being almost unconscious for around four days. He had then become changed in his nature. In later life, with the help of his heavy drinking, he often did very crazy things. One time, when he had been in a public house along with another of their brothers, John Robert had hit him in the face with a glass, and he had then run outside, lay down on the ground, and started to bite his own arm. John Robert's mother also recalled the accident and said after this they often called him Silly Jack. She said he could at times, in her opinion, be very stupid. Neither John Miller or John Robert Miller gave evidence on their own behalf. The defence appeared to be very focused on John Robert Miller as little seemed to be said about the older man, John Miller. The defence on behalf of John Robert stated it was, in his view, clear that John had persuaded him to attack Joseph. John Robert had no reason to do so. There was simply no motive for the attack other than John had made him do it under the influence of the drink. It had really been John who had paid for the knife as evidence had been given that John Robert gave him the change from the purchase. And John Robert was a man who suffered from delusions and was not capable of making very good choices. Was it, the defence asked, really John who had stabbed Joseph, and John Robert had simply admitted to the crime as he knew no better? He asked the jury to consider carefully the medical evidence and the past history of John Robert. The prosecution at this point stated that the jury must also consider that both men had entered the house and the door was closed behind them. No one saw what went on inside or knew who attacked Joseph, only the men themselves, so they must consider carefully if both men were equally guilty. The defence for John Miller stated that it was clear from the confessions, of which there had been three or four, from John Robert, that he had stuck, struck the fatal blow. He was aware of a degree of sympathy towards John Robert, but they must also consider that John had not committed the crime. He was charged because the law stated if two men were present when the crime was committed and if it was felt that one had persuaded the other to act, then he must also be seen as guilty. But there was no proof of this, only what John Robert had said afterwards. And who was to know if this was the truth or not, or just the incoherent ramblings of a man who was insane with the drink? Was it not possible that John Robert went inside for some other reason, and when John heard the disturbance he followed him in, but due to his poor eyesight he could not see what was happening, and by the time he did it was too late to save Joseph? There was no motive other than Mrs. Ferguson suggesting that they were jealous of the money she planned to leave to Joseph in her will, but this seemed to be only her thoughts. Neither man had ever mentioned any arguments over money. The judge in summing up stated that the defence had made much of the fact that there was no motive for this crime, and although he had to admit none had been shown, the absence of it had no real bearing on the case, as often there was no motive that was enough to justify the crimes that had been committed. The jury must decide if this was a crime where both men were guilty, and they must also decide if the younger man, John Robert, was responsible for his actions at the time. The jury retired for only 12 minutes before returning a verdict of guilty of wil willful murder against John Miller and John Robert Miller. When asked if they had anything to say, John Miller stated that he was not afraid to meet his maker as he was innocent. And John Robert said, I have nothing to say, only that I did not know what I was doing or I would not have done it. The judge then sentenced both men to death by hanging and that their remains would be buried within the grounds of Newcastle Prison. Immediately after this, John Robert glanced at friends in the courtroom and shouted out to a woman who was in tears, don't fret, Liddy. John said nothing, and both men were then removed from the dock, and the execution date was set for December the 7th, 1901. It would seem that there was no petition started for John Miller, however, there was one for John Robert, which was sent to the Home Secretary in late November. No grounds for the commut commutation of the sentence were given,
By December the 5th, a reply was received stating that the law must take its course with reference to both men and the execution would go ahead on December the 7th as planned. During their time in prison, it was stated that both men were visited frequently by family and friends. No great details re were reported of their final night in prison, other than the fact that John Robert was said to have screamed and shouted all night. He had been kept in the prison hospital and was only a short distance away from where one of the executioners spent the night, which had disturbed him greatly. On the morning of the execution, it was said that the weather was quite bad. However, this did not stop huge crowds from gathering outside of the prison, although they would not be able to see anything as both executions would take place in private and no reporters would be present. Double executions were quite rare and this seemed to have created a huge amount of interest in the town of Newcastle. John Robert had been somewhat hysterical since the sentence, so the decision was made to hang the men separately, as it was felt that the meeting of the men on the drop may not be a good idea. At this point, the newspaper articles report a very different story to that which was reported in the diaries of John Ellis, who was the assistant executioner on the day, so I have decided to use his version of events as I feel that they will be more accurate, especially as this to, was to be his first hanging, so he would have no doubt recorded the details very clearly. The main executioner was William Billington. He had taken over from his father, James. William was just a young man and was said to be quite a celebrity with the public, often being surrounded by crowds of people wishing to shake his hand or simply say hello to him. Based on the details of John Ellis, John Robert was the first of the men to be hanged. It was said that he had calmed down considerably by the morning, and by the time he was pinioned, which means that his arms would be tied at the wrists, and in this case they were positioned behind his back, he seemed to be resigned to his fate and walked calmly to the gallows. However, on stepping on to the drop, he looked around and asked, Why are all these people here? No reply was given and at this point he attempted to step back off the drop and walk away. Both John Ellis and William Billington had to guide him back into place and quickly tie his legs and place the white cap over his head. The signal was given and the bolt was removed and John Robert fell. Death was said to be instantaneous. A little after 8am, the black flag was raised above the prison walls for the first time to signal to those outside that the punishment of the law had been carried out. And just after 9am, the body of John Robert Miller was removed and the drop was prepared for John Miller. John Miller was said to be calm and also resigned to his fate. As he was pinioned, he stated, Gentlemen, I die an innocent man. He walked firmly to the gallows without assistant. assistance. John Ellis and William Billington worked quickly to tie his legs and place the white cap over his head. Again, the signal was given, the bolt was removed, and John fell. Death once more was said to be instantaneous, and just after 9.30am the black flag was raised for a second time above the prison walls for all the crowds outside to see and after one hour, the body of John Miller was removed. Both were placed in simple coffins and were later buried within the grounds of Newcastle Prison. I am sure some of you will remember me discussing the felon's plot in All Saints Cemetery in other stories. When Newcastle Prison was demolished in 1925, the bodies of the 15 men who had been buried inside the walls of the prison were re removed and reburied in a mass grave in All Saints Cemetery. As also mentioned previously, four of the bodies were never found, but both John Miller and John Robert Miller were found, and they were two of the eleven who were now in an unmarked grave in the cemetery. This was a very odd story. At first there seemed to be no reason for the attack, but later it is suggested to be something to do with money that Mary Ferguson planned to leave to Joseph, and perhaps John Miller felt it should have been his, as it was money passed down previously from his father to his stepmother on his death. But that does not seem to me to be a reason for such a violent attack on Joseph. There may be more, because of John Robert being out of control, which made the attack so vicious. <laughs> 
Did John incite John Robert to commit the crime? In many ways, it seems like this is the only answer. He knew how drinking would affect him and he seemed happy to make sure that he'd had plenty and he took him to buy the knife. The defence suggestion that John did not know what was going to happen seems crazy as at no point in time did he ever mention any other reason to go to the house, which surely he would have done if it had just been a visit to see Mrs Ferguson. Both men were clearly as guilty as each other, but I have to admit to thinking that John Robert really didn't know what he was doing and of the two, his sentence possibly should have been commuted to prison for life. But what do you think? Do you think it was John's influence that caused John Robert to attack and kill Joseph? Or do you think that John took much more of a part of the attack behind closed doors? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I do hope that you have found this sad and tragic story interesting and I do apologise that it is a very long story but because it was about two men there was actually quite a lot more to add than if it had just been about one. I do thank you all very much for watching and I do apologise as always for any mistakes that I've made during this live recording and I hope to see you all again very soon.